wouldn't change places with anyone tonight. Tonight, the creepiest. Tonight, the scariest. Tonight, the most wonderful. Hey guys, Chris at the Movie House, and once again, it's October, which means it's time again for another Halloween hullabaloo. And today, I want to recommend. It's crazy to think that the original Halloween is turning 40 this year. John Carpenter's 1978 classic may not have been the progenitor slasher flick, that in honor goes to Bob Clark's Black Christmas. But Halloween was the movie that defined the genre. It was the one that everyone tried ripping off. Even its own sequels could never even get close to matching it. That's mainly because the creator of Halloween, John Carpenter, wanted to move on and make different kinds of movies, and God bless him for it. But that meant there was no plan, no set course, and the series quickly went off the rails. Yes, like many long-running horror movie franchises, the continuity became a convoluted canonical clusterfuck of half-baked ideas, abandoned plot threads, and ever-diminishing returns. These kind of situations, it gets to the point where franchises either have one of two choices. Either attempt to incorporate everything and just try speeding past the contradictions, or try and clean up shop, ignoring specific entries in order to free the story of narrative shackles. The Halloween films have done the latter so many times that it's natural to be apprehensive about any new installment to the storied franchise, especially one that's written by the guys that did Pineapple Express. But Jamie Lee Curtis is back as Laurie Strode. And John Carpenter is back as producer and composer. They both seem pumped about the franchise in a way that they haven't been since the original. So could it be that this new film is possibly the real deal? Yes. <laughs> yes, it absolutely is. This new film, confusingly just called Halloween, rightfully ignores every sequel, writing them off as bullshit rumors added to the legend of Michael Myers. No, he's not Laurie's brother. No, he's not the puppet of a druid cult. He's back to his purest, most terrifying form. He's simply a sociopathic murderer who kills just cause. And while there may be a supernatural element to him, there is no deep explanation. There is no rhyme or reason to this. In fact, this movie mocks the sequels for ever trying to explain the shape. All that matters is that he's waited patiently, locked away at Smith's Grove's mental ward, and now 40 years to the day, he's gonna get his chance to get the one that got away, Laurie Strode. But she's not the scared girl he attacked back in 1978. She's been waiting for him as well, preparing for decades for their final showdown at the cost of driving away her own daughter and granddaughter. But as the body count heads towards the double digits, it becomes increasingly clear to everyone that Lori is their only hope in surviving the night. I was quickly won over by this new Halloween because of its script written by Danny McBride and David Gordon Green, who also directs. It's smartly written with its plot contrivances given ample justification, something I was concerned about by the trailers. And while this does throw out all the sequels, McBride and Green treat this as a love letter to the entire series with callbacks and Easter eggs all over the place. Christ, they even have some kids wearing the silver shamrock mask from Halloween 3, and that's not even considered part of the original canon. Though most importantly, this treats Laurie Strode and her family with a respect and understanding that the sequels never quite got. Lori survived her first encounter with Michael Myers, but she was never the same. In the hands of lesser writers, this character could have been written like a soccer coach. All yelling and strength, and while she is strong, she is capable. They never lose sight of the toll this all took on her, and by proxy, her daughter and granddaughter. It's a refreshingly realistic take for a horror movie, and Jamie Lee Curtis rocks it! Her performance is strengthened by her co-stars Judy Greer and Andy Matichak as Lori's daughter and granddaughter. These three women are key because this film's angle is about a woman having suffered a traumatic event and having to deal with everyone, even her own flesh and blood, telling her to get over it, failing to understand that the boogeyman is in fact real. But her resolve, her voice, her wrath will not be silenced, and we get immense satisfaction in watching the predator-prey dynamics reverse as Michael Myers expects the women he's stalking to be weak, only to find a den of lionesses waiting for him, ready to beat the living shit out of him, and it's glorious. Actually, even though Jamie Lee Curtis is the star, Judy Greer gets the best moment of the whole movie. The entire audience lost its mind at that point. You'll know it when you see it, trust me. I've wanted Michael Myers to get his comeuppance for such a long time, and for the most part, I was not disappointed. Because my patience tends to wear thin in slasher movie franchises if they end up caring more about the monsters and the victims are merely slabs of meat to be cut through. I don't want evil to win, and if anyone's gonna stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the shape, it's gotta be Laurie Strode. And I care about her and her family. I don't want them to die. 
that creates tension. You know, how horror movies are supposed to work? And beyond our three female leads, this film does a better than usual job with its ancillary characters. I mean, there's definitely a few that we just feel deserve to die, but for the most part, they're quite likable. A lot of that comes from McBride and Green's screenplay. They're naturally really funny guys, so they infuse these new characters with some proper personality. There's one kid in particular being babysat by one of the teenage girls that steals the show. I wish there was more of his bad little ass. In so many ways, this flick is firing on all cylinders. It gets so much right and makes it seem easy. Firstly, it looks and feels like Halloween. Green's directing filmography has been super eclectic, so he's not who I'd naturally assume to make a movie like this. But like Jordan Peele with Get Out, I want to see more horror movies from this guy because he gets it. Flourishes like the brilliantly meta opening credits of a rotten jack-o'-lantern coming back to life. It's not subtle, but it's a pretty good thesis statement for this entire movie. He tries to replicate as much as possible that original film's inky black cinematography. And there's one particularly stunning long take, sadly spoiled in the trailers, of Michael carving his way through a couple houses. Besides the more upper crusty film snob stuff that assholes like me care about, this flick also gets the base level shit right. Dude, how hard is it to replicate a creepy William Shatner Star Trek mask? After the first movie, we had to suffer through fat face, mime from hell, panther neck bird nose, hair metal albino, I can see his eyes, how the hell is that even scary? Eyeliner fish lips and devil's rejects reject. Thankfully, this mask looks great. You know, it only took him 40 years to get it right again. Another place this film knocks it out of the park is in the music. Original Halloween director John Carpenter, on top of being a director, would provide the distinctive stripped-down musical scores for his own movies. And his work on the original Halloween is undoubtedly an important part of why that film is still so effective. That music assaults your ears, it's cutting, and the sequels could never match its power. So it was music to my ears, pardon the pun, having Carpenter come back, scoring this flick, revisiting his old themes alongside introducing some new electronic heavy ones. All this comes together into a movie that just feels like home. This is by far the best Halloween since the original, but even with that praising, I won't deny there's some stuff holding it back from absolute greatness. There's still a high population of idiots making dumbass rookie mistakes, resulting in their bloody squishy ends. And as funny as the flick is, there are a few moments, not many, but there's a few where I feel like it's pushing a little too hard towards comedy, and it kind of pulled me out of it. And lastly, while I really dug the ending, it's a nice emotional closure. I must concede that this is not the most definitive end we've had to Michael Myers in this franchise. Like, while Halloween H2O is a greatly inferior film, its last 10 minutes are still more final. This movie ends at a place where they could totally do a sequel if they want, and judging by how much money it's made, they probably will, but this could also serve as a wonderful send-off to the series, and I'd prefer that. Let Michael stay dead, like Hollywood Video or Zima. One last thing. Filmmakers, when you're restarting a film franchise, don't call your new movie the exact same title as the original film. That's confusing as shit when I'm trying to bring up movies in conversation. Stop it! But all jokes aside, Halloween 2018 is some solid celluloid. Thanks again, guys, for watching. As always, I appreciate the support. And what did you guys think of Halloween the Halloween? God, I just... I... <laughs> Confusing title, stop doing that. But I would really like to hear from you guys. Click down here to subscribe, like, comment, share to your friends, please do. And until next time.